So open your Bibles with me this morning to one of the more beautiful encounters of Jesus. Because Jesus comes back to his favorite house. There were two sisters and a brother. The brother's name was Lazarus. And the sister's names were Mary and Martha. So open your Bibles with me this morning to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. So here are Jesus' closest friends. I know when I went through seminary, the professor said, and one of the things you've got to remember in ministry, that you make no close friends with anybody. And I challenged him at the time and said, that is about the worst advice I've ever been given. Are you suggesting that people in ministry have no need of fellowship and friendship? That is not sound advice. And I found myself that especially in ministry, I need friends that I can just go and kick back in their home and be myself and just enjoy the fellowship and the ministry that, that comes to me. I need that. I don't know about you, but I need that. So you know the background to John 11. Lazarus gets sick, very sick. And our first point this morning comes from, uh, well, verse 3, the sisters, these loving sisters being very concerned for their brother's health, sent a message to Jesus. And they say to him, Lord, behold, I mean, imagine having this said of you, behold, he whom you love. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, we know that Jesus loved everybody, but here it is recognized that Jesus had a very special relationship with Lazarus and his sisters. And the sisters couldn't help saying, he whom you love is sick. Of course, Jesus knows that. But he receives the message. And our first point comes out of verse 4. I don't know how your philosophy of sickness is or your philosophy of trials and tribulations. I'm running into many Christians today who are kicking against the pricks. Someone actually said to me the other day, why is God letting these things happen to me? I'm a believer. I said, that's why he's letting them happen. Yeah. Because God is in the serious business of, and we've seen it this week, the serious business of cleansing us from sin and shaping our characters so we can actually dwell in His presence. He's not saving us in our sins. How, long is, how many times has this come out? He's saving us from our sins from ourselves. So in his incredible wisdom, he permits affliction to come upon us. And what do we do? We wiggle, we squirm, we run. By the way, have you ever tried running from God? Well, I tried it recently. It's pretty exhausting. I actually changed my name to Jonah. <laughs> I should have known that God would give me a whale of a time. <laughs> but I changed my name to Jonah and God kept saying to me, go to Nineveh. <laughs> so I bought a one-way ticket to Tarshish. And I held it up. I'm going to Tarsus. And God said, you want to bet? I'm asking you to go to Nineveh. I said, I'm going to Tarsus. I don't want to go to Nineveh. It's too uncomfortable for me to go to Nineveh. You know what God was asking me to do? He was asking me to move into a television ministry. 
and I am the most reluctant person in the world. I said to God, you've got so many younger, more talented individuals, choose them. I'm going to Tarshish. That's how stubborn I am. So for like 12 months, I refused to even talk about television. God even raised up a young man in a seminar who walked up to me and said, I'd never met this kid before. He said, I had a dream about you last night. I said, oh, well, how fortunate you are, you know. <laughs> I, I hope it was meaningful for you. Oh, he said it was a pretty serious dream. It was like a vision. He said, there was an angel at the end of my bed and he was talking about you. I said, you're kidding. He said, oh, I'm serious. Because, you know, the one thing that God said to me in the beginning, which I think made me run, he said to me, why should TBN, Trinity Broadcasting Network, based in Southern California, the largest religious broadcaster in the world, God said to me, why should they have the airwaves with messages that are not mine? Yes, yes. And we've got this incredible message to share. Amen. And so this young man, this is in Bakersfield, California, walks up to me on Friday night of my seminar and he says, the angel had something interesting to say. It made no sense to me. Maybe it'll make sense to you. I said, what was it? Well, he said, do the letters TBN mean anything to you? That's what he says to me. <laughs> he said, the blood drained out of my face. I said, well, as a matter of fact, they do. Well, he said, the angel said, you are to move forward with what God has directed you to do in regards to TBN. I mean, how much clearer could it get? And I went straight to my travel agent and bought a one-way ticket to Tarsus. <laughs> Even though God said, I want you to go to Nineveh, I want you to do this. I said, I can't, it's too much. I'm not equal to it. And God said, but I am. So for like six months, I enjoyed running. I refused to talk about television to anybody, to even think about it. Made no plans. But the one thing I've learned out about God, if you run from him, he's running with you. <laughs> he's even ahead of you. And he's even there when you arrive. <laughs> and his message is undiluted. Because when you get where you're running to, you know what he says to you? I still want you to go to Nineveh. I say, ah! So I thought I'd escaped him. And I was visiting in North Carolina where I have a daughter living. And I was free for the weekend. I thought, I'll just go and have a quiet weekend at my daughter's. She has twins age five and it is so enjoyable. And she and her husband love to sail, so I knew I'd be going out sailing on that beautiful bay there. If you know Newburn. North Carolina, one of the more magnificent places in the country. Anyway, I called my daughter. She said, sure, come on over. Anyway, we're having dinner Friday night. She said, are you going to church tomorrow? I said, well, I'm planning to. She said, well, you know, there are two churches in town. I said, well, sort of. She said, well, there's the black church, which is downtown. Then about 20 minutes outside of town, there's the white church. She said, which one are you going to? She said, well, why am I even asking you? She said, she said I know you're going to go to the black church because you like the music and everything else. I said, yes, I'm going to go to the black church. I've never been there before. She said, but don't you know the pastor out at the white church? Didn't I hear you say you went to seminary together? I said, yes, we did. But I haven't seen him in like 20 years. She said, you should go there. You should go and see him. I said, well... It's not a big deal. Okay, I'll go to the white church. So I drove out on Sabbath morning. My daughter is not a Seventh-day Adventist, but she's returned to God as a practicing Christian, which I consider a step back. I'm just praising God at the moment. And uh, I drove out to the white church. I made sure I arrived at two minutes after 11 o'clock so I wouldn't get asked to preach because I do know this pastor very well. 
And I drove into the parking lot and there's not one vehicle in the parking lot. So I went over and read the, the big sign and uh, uh, divine service, 9 a.m. And by 10.30, everyone's gone home. I said, I've missed the show. I've missed everything. So I'll drive back into town, even though I'm a little late now, and I'll go to the black church, which I originally intended to do anyway, because God planned for me to go to the black church. I realise that now. So the black church got about 70 members. There's vigorous music. You can hear it halfway down the block. So I snuck into the church. There's one pew at the back of the church that only has one woman sitting on it, a rather well-sized woman, you could say. And she was sitting up one side at one end of the pew. So I crept in and sat up the other end. I'm the only non-black person in the church as I look around. Never been there before. So I start to relax and I notice a little movement at the other end of the pew. And this woman, who's been sitting right at the opposite end of the pew, it's a wooden pew, it doesn't have padded seats, and she's... I said, what is she doing? She's sliding along the whole pew and she gets right up to me and she keeps going and pushes me into the corner of the pew. I'm sort of gasping for breath. You know? And she reaches out this arm that could have belonged to a sumo wrestler. You know, she puts it around me and pulls me close to her and whispers in my ear, brother, we're just praising the Lord that you're here this morning. Oh, I said, thank you so much. Man, I really felt welcome. Now, you know, normally a person would lift their arm from you, you know. <laughs> it was almost as though I was imprisoned. <laughs> and I didn't realise that halfway through the sermon, because this young guy who just got out of seminary didn't even open the Bible, and that really discourages me. You know, I imagine how some of you must feel if you're listening to sermons and you never have the Bible open and you never get into the Word. I mean, that would discourage me. And my desire is to jump up and leave whenever I'm in that situation. So in the middle of the sermon, I went to jump up, but she went... <coughs> <laughs> I was truly in prison. So I realised God's keeping me there for a reason. So I endured the sermon. Now this guy may not have been much of a preacher, but I want to tell you something. He was a powerful evangelist. And at the end of the sermon, and it always ticks me a little bit if a pastor makes a powerful appeal and he's preached a lousy sermon. You know? <laughs> and this guy made the most powerful appeal. And what does he say? He says, God has spoken to me. I said, well, this is good. At least he's in communion. God has spoken to me and told me that there's someone sitting in church this morning who's running away from him. <laughs> I want to tell you something. I sat there very piously and I surveyed the congregation to see who the sinner was. <laughs> I cannot believe how well I practice self-deception, you know. And nobody moved and I said to myself, boy, this is a tough crowd here, you know. So he makes another appeal. He said, God's telling me that I'm to keep doing this until this person stands up and comes forward and repents. <laughs> so he said, whoever you are, because he said, I'm prepared to be here for another hour if necessary. <laughs> Get up out of your seat and come forward and repent. And I want to tell you, I looked around again. I said, my goodness, these are hard-hearted people here. No one is responding. The scary thing was at no point did it ever occur to me that it might be me. That's scary, isn't it? how you can ever reach that point within yourself. Anyway, so he's ready for his third appeal. And I know that, you know, I'd love to slip out, but I can't get away from this woman. <laughs> Not without a scene, anyway. <laughs> 
So what does this young preacher do? There's a gal over here on the piano playing a beautiful piano, by the way, beautiful. I mean, her playing was beautiful. And so the young preacher looks over at the woman at the piano and he goes, like he'd be nodding to you, Judy, he just goes like this. They've got something cooked up between them. And she starts playing. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a, my father was a very musical man, and so I grew up in a very musical home. And even though my father was never a Christian, he loved to sing. And because of my background, we sang all of the old Scottish, one of my grandmothers was Scottish, Scottish and Irish ballads. I know every one of the old Scottish and Irish ballads. I spent my entire childhood singing them. But there's one song that is so moving to me because it brings back the entire experience of my childhood in Melbourne, Australia. It's my favourite song of all time. It's a Scottish song. And if I ever hear it played on bagpipes, I'll just start weeping. Because some of you know I didn't even know anything about God until I was 18 years of age. But I had all these years before that singing these beautiful old ballads. And this is my most meaningful song. Some of you know this song. I've sung it many times myself in karaoke bars and things, you know. <laughs> It's called O oh Danny Boy. The pipes, the pipes are calling. And I'm just so moved whenever I hear that song. In all my years in ministry, I've never heard it in church. And I had no idea that it's in the new hymn book, the melodies in the new hymn book. I didn't know that. I've now found out it also is set to the words of Amazing Grace. I've discovered the same melody but I'd never heard it played or sung in church because in my mind, it's not a hymn. It never occurred to me that somebody may have put sacred words to that music. I associate it with bagpipes and other things. And so the woman at the piano, guess what she starts playing? <laughs> I said, that's daddy boy. That's my song. And God says, hey, knock, knock. <laughs> I said, that's my song. He said, because it's you I'm after. I said, oh, hallelujah. <laughs> God is calling me to repentance and I've been looking there wondering who should be responding. Isn't that a remarkable moment? And so the Spirit of God starts touching my heart. And I'm a pretty stubborn person. I sat there. I began to realise how some of you feel when I make these calls now. <laughs> I sat there and resisted through the whole playing of Danny Boy, even though the spirit was saying, get up. The super glue was so strong. And that woman. <laughs> she finished playing. He makes his appeal. I still don't budge. So the preacher turns over, looks at the pianist again and he goes, and guess what? I've never heard or seen this happen either. She plays the same song a second time. <laughs> How can I miss this message? I said, she's playing it again. I've never seen the pianist sit down and play the same song a second time in church. And this time I am overcome. I yield. And this, my, my guardian angel sitting next to me seems to realise it, you know. She releases me. <laughs> she's not going to let me walk out the door, but she's willing to let me walk up here. <laughs> and I came forward in repentance. I'm weeping. I am so convicted. I said to God, it's so exhausting running from you. He said, I know, I've been trying to keep up with you. <laughs> so I walk up the front. And the young minister, I'm the only person responding. And the young minister leans over and he whispers in my ear, I've been waiting for you. I said, 
He even knew it was me. <laughs> well, I want to tell you something. Why did God have me in that little black church there in North Carolina? Because the moment the young minister called, like I do every morning, called for people to support me in ministry. You know, there's only like 70 people in this church. Every man, woman and child got up out of their seats and they came forward and laid hands on me and just took me unto themselves. Amen. And for like 45 minutes they just prayed and prayed and lifted me up to God. Amen. I was so healed and so restored. What made it so good in the middle of all this, the young minister came over and he said, I'd like to rebaptize you right now. <laughs> I said, well, I think maybe I don't have to be rebaptized this morning, but I'm being baptized by the Holy Spirit right now, and that's what matters, isn't it? Yeah. I have repented, I am freed up, I'm actually willing to say to God, okay, let's do it. I'm ready to roll. I tore up my ticket to Tarshish. I bought another one to Nineveh. And I want to tell you, I'm going to roll now, and God is opening these amazing doors for the television ministry. I should have known all along that it's his enablings that make these things possible, not my abilities. How's your faith this morning? How's your faith? So if illness or circumstances or even something you think is bigger than you is facing you, let those words of verse 4 come forth through to you, please. This sickness is not unto death, but for what purpose? Are you hearing that? Any affliction that comes upon us in our lives <clears throat> is either caused by or permitted by God. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me, nothing, we saw this earlier this week, happens by chance in our lives. God is still in control. Do you believe it? Yes, I do. Amen. Even the enemy cannot freely do anything without getting permission from God. God is the one with all the power and authority. So if you're experiencing any kind of affliction or personal challenge or struggle this morning, I urge you to let this principle sink in. That whatever is coming, even if it's serious illness, it's for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Isn't that powerful? I finally realize it's not the challenges we face in life, it's our attitude toward them which determines whether God is actually glorified or we just end up kicking against the pricks or doing like me, we run for our lives because we're scared that we can't do it. How's your faith this morning? Amen. Death, sickness, calamity, whatever God is permitting or causing, I want to tell you something this morning. It's because he loves you so much. He does not want to spend eternity without you. Amen. And if it's painful to undergo his shapings, I have found it very painful at times. But I've discovered if I have the mind of Jesus in me, instead of being disastrous, it becomes to the glory of God. And God can actually be seen in you through the worst possible circumstances. Second point, moving on. I'm looking at verses 9 and 10. This is a very profound statement here. Well, before we get to verses 9 and 10, let's read the verses in between. Look at verse 7. Jesus turns and says to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. You know, they're in Bethany. They're not really very far away. You can walk there in half a day, you know. Let, let's go back into Judea. He means back into Jerusalem, really. And they've just been trying to stone him in Jerusalem. And this causes... Great anxiety, great anxiety among his 
disciples. Do you notice their responses? Look at verse uh, 8. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. Are you going there again? Are you detecting the little element of fear there? What do you mean you're going back into Jerusalem? We've just left there because they were trying to stone you. Now you want to go back there? It gets better. Have a look at verse uh, 16. Thomas, who's rather famous for doubting, Thomas, who was called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, okay, let's go with him so that we can all die with him. <laughs> okay. Let him have his way. Let's go with him so we'll all perish. <laughs> this is Thomas. I hope you're hearing this. And who are they doubting? Jesus, the one in the crowd who's actually hearing his father's voice. And I love the principle, if you're ever filled with doubt, some people have confessed to me this week their doubts and their cynicism. If you're ever tempted to doubt or be cynical in terms of the leading of God, and especially someone who is hearing God clearly and acting upon it, notice the principle coming through in verses 9 and 10. It's our second point. And Jesus gives this counsel to his own disciples as they beg him to reconsider his decision to go back into Jerusalem. Are you going to get stoned again? I can hear them saying it. It's just happened. They might even kill you. Oh well, we'll just go with you and die too. Imagine what this does to Jesus, you know. But he's on a mission. He has the mind of his father in him. He knows exactly what he's doing. And I love this principle that comes through here in verses 9 and 10. Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because... He sees the light of this world. But look at verse 10, it's an interesting verse. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. I've done some wrestling with this verse till I finally allowed myself to hear it. And I realized, wow, stumbling, stumbling, which we're all guilty of. Stumbling is the result of the light not being in, us. in you. Please hear it. On the positive side, if the light is in you, even though it be dark, you will not stumble. And I want to urge you all to consider that great darkness is beginning to come upon the world. It may even penetrate the church. I'm talking about great darkness. Many among us may stumble. Many, in fact, may be shaken away. Is that going to happen? We know that's going to happen. But those who are not shaken, even though gross darkness is covering the earth and it may be hard even to see the light as during the dark ages, those in the church who do not stumble, those who are not shaken by the wayside, they're not led off into fanciful ideas. I've never met more crazy ideas then today when I'm going to Seventh-day Adventist churches and the things that people come up and share with me, I just look at them and say to myself, what planet are they living on? I mean, outrageous things. Oh, Brother Liversidge, I've just discovered that Jesus is not really divine. I mean, this is new light. I said, well, I want to tell you something. It's as old as the hills of Gilboa because in the first century that heresy arose, way back in the first century. 
It was called the Arian Controversy, and it was all about the nature of Jesus. I said, it's 2,000 years old, that idea. It's not new. Oh, Brother Levisage, I've just discovered that the Holy Spirit is not a person. I said, well, thank you for sharing with me how new age you really are. Go and join a little group where they're making contact with some power out there. It's not God, but it's some power that can re give you the strength to develop every good thing that's in you. How many people are believing today that there's goodness in the human race? And that it can be developed to an ultimate level. I don't believe it for one minute. In me, I don't know about you, but in me dwelleth no good thing. Any goodness in me is God in me, not some power out there. And then today we've got all these thousands of people that are leaving the church because of the investigative judgment. Well, I've got news for you. I don't know about you, but I've seen biblically the real significance of the investigative judgment. It's clear teaching in Scripture. Maybe we have misrepresented it a little in our presentations. It's not a man-focused doctrine at all. The reason God's children are investigated is to reveal the justice and mercy of God at work in their lives. It is magnificent. But many of my friends and colleagues have dropped away because they believe we can't substantiate that teaching. Well, I want to tell you, it's very readily able to be substantiated. And the focus, incredibly, is Christ-centered rather than man-centered. You know, our understanding of all of our teachings are growing every day and expanding. How's your faith this morning? Amen. So I'm going to say it again. Amen. The ability, and I want to tell you, this is going to become more meaningful to you in the days that lie ahead. The ability to not be shaken, to not be stumbling about as though you're in darkness. There's no secret to this. It is the privilege of those who have the light in them. The light. We know that. Something we've been talking about all the week. If Jesus is in you, you can walk in the light even if it's dark all around you. That's a marvelous teaching, you know. A marvelous teaching. So Jesus comes to Bethany. You know, he delays a little bit. You all know that. He finally makes his way to Bethany. The story gets interesting here. Oh, it says here Bethany was actually only two miles away. I thought it was a little further than that. Two miles away in verse 18. And in verse 19, many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. And Martha, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary still sat in the house. Don't you love the words of Martha here? Verse 21. Martha therefore said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Well, that seems to be a great statement of faith, doesn't it? If you'd been here, my brother need not have died. Yet even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And this is, she's a believer. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her in verse 23, your brother shall rise again. And Martha says in verse 24, notice her response here now. There's a huge lesson in this. Martha says to Jesus, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. My goodness, she sounds like a well-indoctrinated Seventh-day Adventist. Now let yourself hear this this morning. Martha is standing in the presence of the life giver the resurrection himself. And what does she do? She gives him a little Bible study <laughs> on her doctrinal correctness. 
we're not so much into political correctness as we are into doctrinal correctness. I know many people who have doctrinal correctness, and I've got no, no problem with that. But I have a problem with doctrinal correctness. If you lay it on Jesus at a time when you are standing in his presence as the life giver. And you give him a little Bible study to remind him, yes, I know there's a resurrection. I know it's at the last days. I know he will be raised up again. This is all provable biblically. And I want to tell you something. Doctrinal correctness without an intimate relationship with Jesus is a killer because it leads people to place their dependence upon the fact that I have the truth. I've heard it so many times. And I've got news for you this morning. Jesus declared himself to be, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you have, quotes, the truth, you have much more than doctrinal correctness. You have an intimate relationship with the resurrection himself. And how intimate is it? It's so intimate that he will actually be in you. You'll have his mind. How can you, with the mind of Jesus, give him a little Bible study about the resurrection when he is the life giver himself? I've often wondered at the end the tragedy of so many when the resurrection returns to raise the dead. How many could actually be raising their hands up saying, Lord, Lord, you know, I've got the truth and I've been doing all these things for you. Don't overlook me. What a tragedy that is. Good people, well-intentioned people like the foolish virgins. Took me years to hear that expression, foolish Virgins, And I said to myself, virginity, in a spiritual sense, well, probably in any sense, but in a spiritual sense, is it a positive or a negative virtue? It's a very positive virtue. It, it's, it symbolizes purity, morality. And one day it struck me, foolish virgins, oh my goodness, these are pure, these are moral people. They're living good lives, which should be to the glory of God. But they are absolutely foolish because they're only lacking one thing. There's only one point of distinction between the wise and the foolish virgins. What is it? They have no additional oil in their vessels. The Holy Spirit has been gradually leaving them, but they're still living good moral lives. I know I got an invitation to preach at the church on the Upper West Side of Manhattan several years ago, a very sophisticated group of people there. And they said to me in the invitation, we don't want an ordinary, one of your ordinary sermons. I said, well, hallelujah. They said, well, we're, we're beyond those kind of questions that you ask. We want in-depth questions. We're a very intellectual congregation. Oh, I said, I can hardly wait. So I asked them the question that just came out now. I asked them to, they said, we want to study the ten virgins. I said, so be it. And you can have as long as you like. I said, oh, hallelujah, I'll do it. I'm so weary of going to churches where... You know, after 30 minutes, the saints want to flee. It's almost as though nobody wants to get into the Word and do any digging today. Anyway, I asked that question, are you hearing the expression foolish 
virgins. And they went round and round and round and I realised that they're not handling this in-depth question, I'll have to fall back on my easier questions. And there was a young man like this young man here and this kid was in the front pew with his mother and he was going like this the whole time. And his mother had hold of his arm and she was pulling it back all the time. At least you haven't done that. <laughs> pulling his arm back all the time. And I finally said, look, no one in the church is answering this question. Let the boy speak. He was eight years of age. So I said, what's your understanding of foolish virgins? I'll never forget this. He grins at me and he says, they're stupid good people. <laughs> I said, wow, that's exactly true. I said, we learn more from a child here today. Stupid good people. I hope, by the way, that there's no stupid good people here this morning. <laughs> I mean people who are morally upright, who are living careful, orderly lives, trying to do all the things that God has commanded them to do even having doctrinal purity, they can show you what they believe. They have the truth and yet don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Never been broken on the rock. Never acknowledged their absolute sinfulness, their great need of Jesus never taken hold of his incredible death or experienced his amazing life within them, never really learned to love, but still doing all the right things. Oh, please, let that expression linger in your mind. I will never forget it. Stupid, good people. That's Martha. Oh, yes, Lord, I know. There's going to be a resurrection. He will come up, but it's at the end of time, remember? Does Jesus know that? Of course he knows that. This is a huge point here. So the point is doctrinal correctness. Without Christ in you, it's disastrous. It could lead you to give Jesus a Bible study when what you need is a resurrection. <laughs> so finally here as we wrap up, it's almost a rebuke, isn't it? Jesus says to Martha, our last point here, verse 25. Martha, I am. Don't you love it? She just told him she believes in the resurrection at the end of the world. Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Wonderful. Isn't that incredible? He <clears throat> who believes in me shall live <clears throat> even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. He's talking of the second death. Do you believe this? By the way, I don't have time to develop the rest of the story, but I want to close with this thought. That it's all about knowing the resurrection and the life. It's all about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you're resting on the fact that you have doctrinal purity, you know what I'm calling you to this morning, don't you? Amen. Repentance. Because you are standing this morning in the presence of the resurrection himself. And he wants you to know this morning that he who believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. 
for he will never die in a biblical sense. Never die. By the way, when Jesus finally calls Lazarus in verse 43, those magnificent words, Lazarus, come forth. I love Ellen White's comment on that. She says, if he had not called Lazarus by name, every dead person within hearing would have arisen. <laughs> if he just said, come forth, there would have been hundreds of resurrections. So he had to narrow it down to one person. That's the power of the resurrection, huh? So as I conclude this morning, please substitute your own name there. Take out the name of Lazarus and put in the name of Bill or whatever, John or whatever your name is. Come forth. God is calling every one of us today not to put our hope in a resurrection at the end of the world, but to know now that if the light is in us today, we can experience that resurrection again for another complete day of our lives. Amen. So this is a serious call to repentance this morning. It's not a general call. Only to touch anybody sitting here who's honest enough to admit that maybe you are a Martha, Maybe you've got absolute confidence in the teachings. Maybe you can even prove your beliefs. But you are convicted this morning that doctrinal correctness is not enough. You need an intimacy with Jesus himself. And you're giving him absolute permission to be dwelling in you today so that you can see every evidence of a resurrected, renewed life today within you. Is there anybody like that here this morning? If there is, you know what to do about it. Wow, look at this. We never fail to get a response here. I'm trying to think of an appeal that will not get a response, but I can't think of one. You guys are so open to what the Word is saying to you. Come forward and, and kneel down today, please, or wherever you are, just slip down on your knees if you're responding this morning. Or sit, that's fine. Yes, sit. And you can remain standing if that's uh, better for you, that's fine. You know, no problem. Yes, no. We've used this word repent a lot this week, haven't we? And I want to tell you that God is being glorified in this place because repentance is God's gift to his own children. He's continually calling them back to do things his way. And this morning he's wanting to indwell every single one of us as we walk out of this church. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, we confess this morning, Father, that in us dwells no good thing. We confess sometimes we become very comfortable in believing we've got the truth. Father, we even measure others at times by our understanding of the truth, and we repent of that. Because this morning it's come through to us loud and clear that there is a grave danger of doctrinal correctness without the intimacy with Jesus Christ. And through our repentance this morning, <clears throat> we invite you by faith to indwell us through the Holy Spirit. In the most beautiful and powerful manner today, Father, come into the hearts and lives of all who are opening their hearts to you today. Come in and dwell with them, Father. Be one with them. Give them every assurance of the fact that your love, your joy, your peace, your gentleness, your goodness, your purity is being imparted to them as I speak and they will walk out of here glowing with the living Christ in them. Yeah. And Father, as we draw closer and closer to the end of this world and it gets darker and darker, we just pray for grace to maintain our connection with Jesus Amen. so that with the light in us, Father, our feet will never stray from the path 
that they have been planted upon. Thank you for the privilege of growing together this week. We leave here with praise on our lips in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Go together with him today.